today we're going to talk about disability in archaeology, more specifically how we can make archaeology more accessible for people. Um, and today we're going to focus on vision impairment. So, who are we? Um, that is a very old photograph of myself. Um, the only reason I put it on there is because it was from an excavation that I did over in Finland. And they had um, a wheelchair participant and they also had um, the site team part of the girl was autistic and they dealt with it really well. So if you have any questions about that, I'm free at the end to have a chat. Um, so I am Victoria, I run Access to Archaeology. So what we do is we make, um, provide opportunities for people to get involved with archaeology through workshops, excavations, various talks. Uh, we work with a wide range of disabilities, so we've worked with um, the PACE Centre, um, which deals with a lot of non-verbal communication. Um, we've worked with mental health, um, vision impairment, um, and a whole host of other um, disabilities as well. Um, so now I'll just pass you over to James to introduce himself. Morning, everybody. Oh, is it morning? Yeah, it's still morning. Isn't it? um, well, my name is James Goldsworthy. Um, my business is Alternate Visions Coaching. I'm a vision impairment specialist and I'm an access I'm an assistive technology trainer and a coach. Um, so I've been working with Victoria with on access to archaeology um, in working with vision impairment and, and uh, mm -hmm. how we can make um, archaeology that a little bit more accessible for people with vision impairment. So what do we mean by disability? Now I'm going to go through this because I would imagine there are a few people in the room who aren't that familiar. Um, so the word disability can have um, a negative connotation, even in today's society. Um, we're very focused on the medical model of disability, which Theresa mentioned earlier, where we view the disability as a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, however, this is not the case. Every individual has their own coping strategy for undertaking the tasks that they wish to do. Um, this model also feeds into the social model of disability, where we as a, as a society put up barriers um, to prevent people from doing what they want to do, um, whether they're real or perceived barriers. Um, however, the problem is not the disability itself, the problem is with our perception of the disability. So, having a disability um, is defined in the Equality Act, which I'm sure everyone in this room is very familiar with, as having a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term negative effect on your ability to do normal activities. Um, however, it doesn't mention the coping strategies that you naturally put in place to overcome the barriers that you have. So, as mentioned in the Equality Act, not all disabilities are visible. You don't always know if someone has a disability, so mental health is is a major one which um, is only really just being more openly spoken about. So unless you're aware, you would not necessarily know that James is blind. So now I will pass over to James to talk about vision impairment. Okay, so um, as Victoria said, I'm blind. In fact, I'm what's classed as severely sight impaired, which is, for all intents and purposes, absolutely nothing. I've got no light sensitivity, no movement, no colour, nothing, absolute blackness. Um, so, just as a bit of an overview, really, um, vision impairment is generally um, divided into two categories. First of which is severely sight impaired, like myself. The second of which is vision impairment, which is which can range from somebody that needs really severe um, prescription glasses all the way up to having enough vision to move around, navigate outside in their, on their own or, or move around their own home and they can perhaps see some light, some colour and some movement but really there's no, um, no great degree of detail. Um, the severely sight impaired category, which is what I am, um, can range from the uh, having light and movement but not enough to actually personally navigate yourself around outside so that's generally how it's how it's classified um, so 
vision impairment and archaeology then. Do you think archaeology can be accessible to vision impairment? On the surface of it, most people would probably go, oh no, you can't possibly do that. Well, that's rubbish. It's perfectly, perfectly accessible. <coughs> you can do it. I've done it. You know, I'm not an archaeologist, by the way. I've, apart from a case study we did last year, I've never been involved in archaeology at all. So this has been really interesting for me. And um, I can categorically say that yes, archaeology is perfectly accessible to people with visual impairments of all degrees um, with a few tiny, tiny little adjustments. Okay, um, so briefly just to explain this slide a little bit, um, up here are four um, of the main sight conditions that you can get. You've got edge-related macular degeneration and it kind of affects vision in this sort of way. So you've got normal vision as a normal bridge, but you lose central vision. Um, so that makes things like reading awkward. You've got glaucoma, which um, is the gradual narrowing in of your peripheral vision. So you've still got quite a bit of central vision, um, even in this advanced glaucoma picture. Um, and even to a degree in this extreme one, but you're losing any of the peripheral vision. Um, cataracts here, you've got the um, cloudy lens um, in your eye, uh, which can vary depending on the severity. Um, and then you've got diabetic retinopathy, which um, I think is the nastiest one, if you can recall any of them particularly nice, but this one isn't very pleasant at all. Um, you can lose spots of vision anywhere in your eye and it's due to the um, blood vessels um, replicating. So just correct me if I'm wrong on any of those, James? No, you won't. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've done that bit. Um, okay, so now I will tell you about last year. Um, we did a four-week excavation with Newdengate, a mental health charity in Buckinghamshire. Um, they approached us um, after seeing us at an accessibility event to run something slightly different for their participants who would normally be like excavating on the allotment or they'd, at that point they were digging a pond. Um, so they thought, hey, why not let's just get an archaeologist in and just go through some of the kind of procedures. Um, so they really, really enjoyed the experience. In fact, they keep on at me to go back and do more. Um, and by the end of it, they were bringing bits from all around the site. So they were saying, oh, can you identify this? A lot of it was um, just uh, farm implements and things that had been on the site and been discarded, but they were really engaged in trying to learn a bit more. So as part of this, um, I invited James down for one day to see how we can make it more accessible for someone with sight loss. Personally, I made no ch changes to the methodology. Obviously, I did the uh, risk assessment uh, based on James's specific needs, but if you're, which you can do if you know who's coming on site, so you can um, make it really, really safe, although that doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to get your accident, but we won't that. Um, so um, I made virtually no changes, and we did a lot of the um, accessibility um, adaptations on site on the day. So I'm a trained sighted guide and we had another volunteer who was available to help. Um, so now I'm going to pass on to James to get a participant's perspective. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I've never done this before. I was quite excited. It was a gorgeous July, it was the 8th of July, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, gorgeous sunny day, you know, shorts and t-shirt weather. It was either lay out on the grass and get sunburned or go and do a little bit of archaeology. So uh, I will just point out you are actually wearing a fleece in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been before we started. That must have been in the shade. It was nice though, because I remember being boiling hot. Yeah. 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 Anyway, <laughs> it was honest. Um, okay. So um, yeah. So as as Victoria's mentioned, you know, when it comes to risk assessments, 
you can do a standard risk assessment um, and that's going to cover you for anything anyway. So you're not actually doing any additional work um, in terms of, you know, having a vision impaired person on site. Obviously it helps because Victoria and I have worked together before so she knows me so she had a bit of a head start but actually um, for all intents and purposes it's a standard um, risk assessment. Um, Victoria is a trained, um, I nearly said psychic guide then, <laughs> is, a, is, a, is a trained guide for visually impaired um, people so uh, that's really handy now I would always encourage anybody that's going to have a vision, visually impaired person or visually impaired people indeed on their site to actually have at least one person that is fully trained up and by that I mean really has attended a training session done the workshop had some hands-on experience and things like that on the day we did have a chap that was very 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 willing to um, become trained in sighting guide and have a little bit of on-the-job training so basically we threw him right in the deep end and um, it was a really good learning experience for him it was a good laugh for me because you know it's brilliant working people out when, you, when they're guiding them around and it just takes the edge off a little bit <laughs> and I, I always open with you know if I go down I'm landing on you so it, 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 it breaks the ice a little bit so that that works really nicely so that's always something to bear in mind um, Certainly in terms of your risk, risk assessment as well, if you've got somebody that is fully um, sighted by trained, then that's going to help you with that. Um, and it just covers you a little bit more with insurance and things like that. So it's just good practice, I think. Okay, so moving on to the specifics of the day. So uh, in terms of um, having somebody that's visually impaired along, a lot of it lies in the preparation, as you can probably imagine. So the first thing, of course, is the point of contact. Now, Victoria and I already know each other, but for, for a moment we pretend that we didn't know each other. And I'd approach Victoria and said, look, I'm really interested in, in doing this, I'm, but I'm blind, um, never done it before, a bit nervous, what do I need to do? She's got to communicate with me, probably going to have a telephone conversation, but most communication is going to be via email in terms of documentation and things like that. Now, I can't stress enough that it's really quite important that these things go out in an accessible format. It's no good sending somebody that's blind or visually impaired something that their, com their computer software can't read. So as a general rule of thumb, a Word document, a PDF document, or a plain text document can't really go wrong because practically everything will read these, those things these days, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, a PC, a Mac, whatever. Okay, So that's a really good rule of thumb to start with. Um, now. On the day, what we did was we spent, it was about 10, 15 minutes at the beginning, um, Victoria actually showed me how to use the troweling technique. I didn't have a clue, I just thought I'd dig it, throw it in the bucket, and that was it. So, you know, we spent a bit of time, um, she had some soil in a, in a big tray thing, and she showed me the technique, how to hold, what I'm feeling for, um, and the gentle scraping, rather than the digging and flinging it over my shoulder, which I was expecting. So now that was really very, very useful. So I can, I'm sure you can all imagine that when you can't see anything at all, tactile is massively important, okay? So getting hands-on experience is really, really important um, to anybody that's blind or got a, got a visual impairment because it's, it's that extra sensory experience that actually gives you more feedback so you can understand what you're doing. You can get your head around it. It's a hell of a lot more interesting and it's much better than somebody standing in front of you going, you get the trowel, you just <laughs> scrape it. Oh, it's just, you know, so you can imagine. Right, so that was really useful. Now, something as an aside came out of that. I had no idea that there were so, so many different types of trowel that you can use, like the curved edges, the fade work. Oh, that was just a new world for me. <laughs> but what I did notice is we tried, I think it was four or five different trowel types out. And it was very apparent to me straight away that actually wooden handled trowels are much better for feedback because the feedback comes through your hand you can feel what it is. Now that, most people wouldn't, wouldn't notice that. It's only ever going to be a blind person that's even going to notice that, but that's a really useful little tip. Rubber handle ones, not so good, because obviously the rubber absorbs the feedback that you get through your hand, therefore the information that you get into the brain, uh, and so on and so forth. So that was a really nice, useful little thing, which was quite, quite interesting. So, um, we did that as a bit of preparation first. Um, gave me an opportunity to ask questions, 
you know, what on earth do I do if I find something? Do I jump up and down on the spot saying, <laughs> I've got it, I've got it, or, or whatever. Um, but uh, that, it just gave me a chance to answer, ask questions. Victoria could answer them and yeah, made me a lot more comfortable. And therefore, I think now, obviously, I'm quite a confident blind person. Not everybody's as confident as me. So if you've got somebody who's really quite timid, doing something like that is hugely valuable, hugely valuable, because it gives them a little bit of confidence in what they're doing. And they don't feel like they're being put on the spot um, when they actually get into their, into their home. Um, okay, so the next thing we dealt with was actually getting out to the dig site itself. Um, so we're in like a porter cabin, you need to walk probably about 60 meters I should think um, and it was over very rough ground it was dry grass and clumps and mud and stuff like that now it's quite important really to to communicate the ground conditions underfoot to the person that you're guiding for obvious reasons I'm sure I don't need to spell it out um, now it really can just be as simple as on the day check out the ground conditions and during your conversation right at the beginning perhaps when you're doing the, the, the trail um, technique um, guidance um, just giving an overview to the person of what, what it's like so they know what to expect because there's nothing worse and I can tell you this from bitter experience there's nothing worse than not having no clue of where you're about to put your feet and only to find there's a six inch drop before you step forward um, whether that be a pothole or, or whatever it happens to be so that's really quite useful um, and you can do that in a variety of ways so that could be in the pre-communication for example um, final confirmation email or something you know just to let you know underfoot it's very dry um, hard ground um, but quite flat or it's very very um, muddy and slick and, and whatever it happens to be so that's quite useful information okay I'll talk fast <laughs> okay, so um, right, so when you get to the site itself, so things we notice. Now there are so many things here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because I'll get kicked. But um, there are a few things that are quite um, instantly recognisable. Obviously, orientation is a huge deal for somebody that can't see. So you stick somebody in a hole and you walk away. Yes, they're in that hole, but they've got no idea where where the exit is or the entrance in this case. Um, whether they're looking towards a group of people in, in their own respective holes in front of them, whether they're to the left or to the right. Now, most people will adapt to that over time anyway, but what we found is if you can put a visually impaired person in a hole that's near an entrance, whether it's directly in front of it or just to one side, it's useful because it's, a, it's quite a useful point of orientation for that person. Um, alongside that, obviously, audible input and um, brightly contrasted colour input is, is useful as well. So what I suggested was if there was just a, a stake in the, a, a bamboo stick in the ground with a little tinky bell from a cat's collar or something on a bright yellow flag, um, I can hear it so I can, oh yeah there's the exit just over my right shoulder. Um, for somebody that's visually impaired and can see contrast they can see the nice bright yellow flag that's sort of fluttering a little bit in the breeze or if Victoria's feeling particularly um, amusing, she can just go and rattle it and you know, get some <laughs> attention. So that's quite useful as well. Now, last thing, because I know I'm running out of time. We, <laughs> orientation of somebody that's in their hole, you'd think that putting somebody in a, in a foothold that's six foot by five foot, is, well, they can't go anywhere. No, of course they can't. But what they can do is trip over the bucket that's been put in front of them that the person didn't tell. <laughs> so, so Victoria, bless her, puts it down. I don't know where it is. Turn around. I'm at it. I'm straight over. Knee's gone in the bucket. I'm off flat on my back. Learning experience. So, something I'd really, really encourage is get the person in the hole. Just give them the bucket because then they can put it down where they are. They can orientate themselves. They know where it is. Um, and it just saves, I mean, it was hilarious on the day, but you know, <laughs> there was pointing and laughing, it was excellent. But, um, but yeah, basically, so that's a few, a few little tips, and there are a lot more, um, but oh, we're out of time, so um, really that, that kind of wraps it up. Yes, it does. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes. No, no we don't. Well, no, no, no. Well, okay.